hello and welcome to season six, episode two of Euphoria. It's Dracos here again with, you guessed it, none other than Frost Current. You can call us Frosted Drakes, you can call us Mom and Dad, or Drake Current or Frost Ghost. Like, there's a lot of names. The dynamic duo. The dynamic duo. The deadly duo. Ooh, deadly duo. That one feels weird because I think neither of us are very menacing uh, uh, physically. I have a neck tattoo. How do you think I got this? Yeah. This I didn't think- happen at a tea party. <laughs> In the knife fights in the street against the hipsters in the streets of Portland, Frosk. Yes. Oh wow. Yeah. Really, really going deep on that. The one. barista turf wars. I was a part of those. Yeah, it was a dark time. It's a lot like that scene in Anchorman, uh, where all the news agencies <laughs> fight. Uh, anyway, guys, there's a lot to talk about this week. We had a really huge week in LAC, um, but similarly, our friends over in the LCS had a huge week of their own. Um, and while we were very fortunate to receive a lot of you know very very positive feedback. Um, some of it was at the expense of LCS and what many people feel to be was a really, really difficult week. So just before we get into the LEC portion of our show, we wanted to talk a little bit about kind of some of the negative sentiment, some of the, let's say, community backlash, I guess you could say, against a lot of what uh, LCS is trying to do right now. It's happened into a pulse on what the community are are talking about right now. And um, first and foremost, I think it just needs to be stated, LEC being produced from studio versus the ridiculous complications and limitations of trying to make a show from home we had to do our playoff run like we are so happy to be Mm. in studio but that like that means that it's always even subconsciously even if you're not aware about it if you're just looking at the products of course the lec is going to feel better right now because it's it's back home in its studio yeah the difference in energy when i get to look at you in the face when i talk to you as opposed to like there being maybe a half second delay and me waiting for my turn to talk because i pushed t in a discord call to signal all talk net and our, you've muted yourself and, and you i can't muted myself and i'm like ah, great point frost like it's trying to save a laugh from half a second ago when i heard what you said yeah it's really tough you're just sitting in your own like damp disgusting chair where it's just like swamp ass all up the back yeah i hate it so from a talent perspective you know like i we don't know the inner workings of the lcs show right they're very different broadcasts and i think they do a lot of things similar to us and they do a lot of things different but what i will say is from a talent perspective remote sucks like it really like to put it simply remote really it's really hard it's hard to get in a good flow it's hard to get in a good groove and it's hard to take it seriously because i imagine similar to uh pro players back in the day who if they had to play in a gaming house and then also play online tournaments it'd be hard to like treat that performance differently it's really hard as a caster because i the suit isn't an important part but the act of coming in getting dressed getting makeup like mentally prepares me to take this stuff seriously so when i've got producers like you know this is playoffs we got to be really serious me and frost are in our underwear in our respective houses and like we know g2 with this game they're casting is in the same boat like i guarantee you mickey's like eating pretzels in one hand while he's playing this this semi-final that best explains of a lot of those <laughs> yeah it's hard to take and it's hard and it's like yes we are professionals and yes like we do our best to take it seriously and give it that same prestige but it's just online and remote broadcasts are so difficult and don't, don't get me wrong i've uh i've worked at various different stages and various different products like i worked at the opl which was in a a basement and then the lpl which was also in a basement and then the lpl in an arena which our audio wasn't going through the arena but finally got the feed the or feel the vibe of the crowd and then i've also worked in now the lec when we had our berlin studio in-house it is such a different experience to be able to talk to a crowd to feel that energy as a performer and yeah there's always going to be like a, a baseline but it does make a huge difference for me personally in the type of product that I'm able to deliver or the type of performance that I'm able to give. And the thing is, is like the LCS team, that's the team that we work with at World. Like Mm -hmm. I have worked with those guys a million different times. I've worked with those producers a million different times. And they, uh, you know, when a world's broadcast looked as polished and as beautiful as it is, that's a huge portion. They, you know, they deserve 50, at least 50% of the credit there. And, And often it's more because we're in their studio using their resources with their team and their workflow. So, um, I just think that Reddit was hating on us just about three months ago. All they do is analysis. Da, 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 da. Memes. All they do is memes. It's all cringy content. And sometimes it just feels like it it rolls over. So I feel I feel for my colleagues right now. Um, and maybe that makes me like a biased source, but I think that there's always going to be criticisms for growth in like every mm. broadcast. Um, but I think like some of the rampant hate that I've seen and like the more nuanced discussion should be, okay, well, it's cool that the LCS is um experimenting like lec had to go through so many different iterations of vettius before we landed on the one that we thought was tolerable like 
Yeah. And I think the thing is, is that we experimented a lot with humor. And people, and Vettius is a great example, because when you remember how Vettius started, people were like, this guy is so cringe, and I hate him. And now people are like, I love Vetti. Vetti, like everything that comes They're out of like, Vetti's I lips. I hate Vetti. I is, love Flexi. Is gold. Yeah. They are like, they love a personality, but they hate Vetti, right? And like, and that's because Vetti, and in part of our broadcast as well, was willing to take those risks on humor. And now we see, I think, NA taking some similar risks with Sushi Dragon, which if you don't love that, I, like, I get it. It's not really for me either. But in order to find what really works for your audience, you have to be taking willing to take risks. You're not just going to hit the nail on the head first time. And people may want to rewrite our history. And it's favorable. I'm not going to lie that we've always hit the nail on the head. We haven't. I personally have been a part of so many segments that were not funny that just like flew under the radar and got no commentary whatsoever. Every time I... Uh, so obviously, like when I joined the LEC, it feels like it's always been on kind of like an up end. Like obviously, there were some dark periods where it dipped in and out. But <laughs> talking about 2016 <laughs> but that's the thing like i hear about all of these um like the hard times and those were like the deficio and and the crepa uh crepo years where it was like uh the the golden child of the analysts for the eu lcs before coming into the lec but you know losing talent is always going to hurt mm -hmm. i mean losing jot will always hurt yeah um i can say that as Someone who is a peer of Jats, uh, there's no one better on the analyst desk. Just like not even what he says. Like people will always be like, oh, you're good at the analyst desk. It must be the content that you say. It's like, no, no, no. It's not just about the content that you say. It's your delivery and your delivery and what words you choose to emphasize, the tone of voice that you're using and your body language. No one had better body language than Jat. If you go back and watch all the old Jat clips, sorry, this is now going to turn into like my Jat love thread it's fine it's fine sorry jet um Ode to jet you know the body's fine he always <laughs> picks the outside of the desk because it allows him to use his wingspan and his body language effectively if you're in the middle of the desk you feel like you're like you're buckled in you got to keep like your elbows at your side you can't really move which is why i always pick the outside of the desk now oh. you and i were just on desk you were like where do you want to sit i'm like i'm going to the I outside i thought they put me in the middle because i'm better at looking back and forth uh, but no, no one, that's they, you you're stealing the outside from me it's strategic that's the trap you never want to be in the middle because you're stuck on like that swing pin and you can't really open up your arms you want to be good at delivery you you pick the outside but you have to use your arms why would you tell me that you could have had an entire year of me thinking because i'm trying to level you up right now <laughs> okay so to wrap this up because we don't want to spend too much more time on it we, we know that you're here what i'll say is like if you have criticism that's fair you're a viewer and you're entitled to your opinion and like if you love the, the lcs broadcast and you're disappointed with what it is now or you want more from it it's totally fair to ask for that but also understand that like New stuff isn't always going to feel good. People hated our champion select at first. Now I think they really like it. People hated our graphics package at first. Now I think they really like it. So I'm not saying you have to love it. People really hated all of our new stuff. All of our new stuff. And now it seems like people really like it. So what I'll say is just like give them, you don't have to give them the benefit of the doubt, but like no, give I... it time to see if you still hate it in a month. You know, like be willing to come back with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective. I think it is about benefit of the doubt. Like the, again, biased <laughs> Riot has shown like a history of making the right decisions usually over time. Eventually, when it comes Akali's to a great example. A was a big problem a for a long time, but eventually was balanced. No, it but just I'm, took a little while. I'm talking specifically about broadcast, like um, esports. Huge credit to all of our other esports around us, like the CSGOs, the Dotas, um, TI, obviously very amazing. But I think Riot really set like a standardized bar of what you need to hit to be considered like a serious broadcast. And I think to just overlook those contributions and the people who have done that and not trust them that they'll get it right, I think is a bit of a misstep in a very nuanced conversation. Shout out to Travis. I've actually really liked his video on it. I think he hit a lot of really great beats. Yeah, you can check that out. Uh, I think Travis Gafford is a YouTube channel. He talked about it on Hot Leg League as well. I didn't get to watch the full episode, so I can't speak to that. Was that the one with that. Broxa? That was on Broxa came on too. Yeah, so Travis is making, I think, good content about it and is doing a good job of acknowledging his limitations and what his perspective is. So shout out to Travis um, and like kind of giving references that I think are really... Um, Easy to understand. But we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. We'll come now into our LEC portion of the show. We have Cabo Shard and Mickey coming on today to talk about their respective teams, um, Vitality and G2. But before we get into that, we got to give you kind of a TLDR of last week. We're going to try to do something like this every week to give you just a quick summary. And today it's going to be in the form of absolute and total overreactions, <laughs> Frost Gurren. Um, because like, who? what better? It's Admittedly, there's three games instead of two, but it's still a tiny sample size. So when better to get your hyperbolic overreactions? You want to kick it off? Uh, I have to come up with an overreaction. A, a literally any overreaction. Oh, uh, this one's really controversial because I think <laughs> we have Vitality like later on on the mm. show. Um, 
I think an overreaction is that SK and Vitality are middle of the pack teams. Yeah. That's that one. That's it. You just you beat G2, you beat OG, and that's it. You're just bam, middle of the pack. Uh, Because here's the thing. Uh, Yes, what I saw from um, SK in particular, I really liked. Like, I thought their macro movements were really intelligent on how they were reading the map in certain situations. But I'm just like, if you look at strength of schedule, especially in a super week, like, Mm. super week covers a lot of these. Because if you're going downhill, like, whatever, if you had shit prep going into the super week, guess what? Now you have three games that were built on that shit prep as opposed to just the two of them. And I think it's inflated and, uh, like, deflated a lot of teams' opinions where I feel like we're going to rock into week number two and everything that you thought you learned in week number one isn't true. Now, there are some true takeaways for SK and Vitality. One, that... If a team has a terrible read on draft and runs into these teams, these teams are good enough that they will punish you. And I think that is a really positive maneuver for them. But I think it's a massive overreaction to suddenly be like, Vitality and SK in the fight for playoffs. I'm like, oh, come on, let's let's pump the brakes a little bit here. I like that one, frankly. My mine is similarly on this Vitality train. We have Cabo on for a reason today. And I think it's because we're both uh, excited about Vitality is that the Greek bottom lane is going to be top four by the end of the split. That's your... They smacked Mickey X. What? They smacked Mickey X. Did you not see the power of the Thresh Callista duo? Admittedly, can, they spent an entire game getting hooked by Hillisang. But that's Hillisang. You can't stop that. That's can I? Happen. Wait, if I send, I'm looking at my producer right now. Depa, if I send you a clip right now, can you get that into the, he's shaking his head he's no. shaking his head. Okay, follow along with me. What? Just explain what the, po- the point in the game because no one can see this but you. So you're just going to have to give me the point just talk about it just tell me about it you okay. don't need to watch it and narrate it because i it's not gonna make any sense it's <laughs> I'm, not radio gonna, I'm not gonna do like a play-by-play <laughs> if you look at the early lane phase of perks and mickey x versus mm. uh lebrov and comp that's what i was looking at yeah and guess what <laughs> uh lebrov misses like all of his skill shots mickey ints it totally walks up gets level two on and then lebrov hits his, his skill shot and they um force like mickey x to recall burn both of his summoners and at that point you're like well i guess the lane's done because i just lost all the summoners on my tom kinch for nothing at level two like luca's looking over at mickey like what are you doing right now and mickey's like ah this one's probably on me but Ah. as soon as that happened lebrov goes back to just whiffing all of his skill shots he like misses like a point blank hook like i totally get it comp and lebrov aren't bad but to say that they're going to be a top four bot lane when bot lane overreaction is so stacked i that's unacceptable (laughs) Fine, I'll do. I'll do the inverse. Mickey is washed. He can only play Tom Kent. Maybe that's my overreaction. <laughs> overreaction. <laughs> Mickey is still playing with one hand. Oh my god! All right. Well, we've got a Kaiba Shard inter- in an interview coming up shortly. Um, but those are some overreactions to kick you off. I'll let you know what your gross overreactions are on Twitter hashtag Euphoria Podcast. If you want to jump in, I would love to have some absolutely hyperbolic conversations with people on Twitter uh, after this airs. But our final segment, it's going to be a recurring one, and it's my favorite new segment um, coming in. It's 45 seconds where we each get to rant about a single topic. It's just solo ranting. It's not a conversation. You okay. interrupted me last time I wanted to rant, so I just, oh, just letting you know. I'll just, I won't interrupt you either. It's okay. It's a, We both like to get in on it. Um, it's called That's <laughs> Dumb. Once some more, because I've been told we're going to bleep it out. That's dumb. 45 seconds for us to rant about something and anything related to uh, League of Legends uh, in, in any context. Frost, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Um, are you doing the uh, the play and am I doing the item? No, 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 no. The play is later. Oh. The play is later. So you can I can do just the, talk about whatever I want? You can do the item. Ardent you, Sensor. All right, I'm going to set a timer. Are you ready? Okay. 45 seconds starting now. Go. Ardent Sensor. That's f- dumb right now. This item is so gold and cost efficient. It's 2,300 gold. You get what? Like 60? Yeah, 60 ability power, 10% CDR, 10% heal and shield power, 8% movement speed for whatever reason on that item. And then that's on top of the 50% base region as well as its unique passive. And I believe you did the gold breakdown of how much gold you get when it's on. How It was like 5,000 gold. Yeah, so I copied it from Law Wiki because Law Wiki are the homies and they did it for us. But yeah, 5K gold for you and one ally healed is the item value. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous. I've seen Vladimir's running around with Arden Sensor. If a Vladimir is building what's supposed to be a mana regen item, guess what? That's f- dumb. And the build path is so smooth for it. Bam. That's it. That's 45 seconds. You nailed it, Frostgrim. All right. My turn. All right. Here's... <clears throat> I got to set my own timer here, so you got to bear with me. All right, my theme is calling for players to be benched after one week of play, and I'll go now. Here's the deal. 
People suck at League of Legends sometimes, audience. And look, I get it. Misfits and Shaka, their supports entered it a lot this week. But the fact that for new players to come on our stage and you're like out here with torches and pitchforks, like bench this guy right away. He's utter but trash. But I want to see rookies. Yeah, we don't see scrims. We don't see any of this. Like teams are going to take risks and put new players on stage and we should to a certain degree support that. Now, if he ends for four weeks straight, I'm with you. Some teams have taken way too long to make that decisions. But in one week of online play for guys who are many of them playing their first LEC games or first LEC games in a long time in the case of nukes, you can't just be like bench this dude. Can you be like this guy was boosted? He played a bad game. Yes, absolutely. You have eyes. You're allowed to say that. But to assume that you know enough in the background to make this call is ridiculous. Stop calling for play to be benched after one week i went a little bit over i abused my power i'm sorry that was did four you also have that script or no oh that was all free form yeah it was all free form oh, nice there's actually like three points that i missed but the bottom line is like it just it really irritates me that people assume that they know so much anyway speaking of rookie players who no one wants to bench because they absolutely popped off last week against g2 uh we're gonna have a little conversation with vitality's kappa shark all right, now we're joined by none other than the victorious top laner of Vitality, Cabo Shard. Cabo, I'm so happy to see you so successful after week one because last split was so, so difficult. How does it feel to have made kind of such a big turnaround to come out and be 2-1 already in uh, week one? I mean, honestly, it, it feels great. Obviously, we don't want to start again on like the 0 4 0 6 or like wherever it was getting us last split. And I think... We needed actually that to to prove ourselves that we were able to still win because I think two sixteen can be very um, like for the mental it, it it can be pretty bad. So I think that's why if, when you compare the Shalk match to the G two one, we are playing actually so much um, scared on the Shalk match, and we're like, okay, we know we're the scaling. If we don't want to fight this Drake, we wait for one more item or whatever. And on the G two. We kept pushing more for things, and we don't let them like much more time to to come back. And I think that's more, more the style we want to to go to. When we were talking before this interview, um, actually started recording, Cabo, you were talking about this idea of you know not being afraid to experiment or to like play these picks. You pulled out the Scion, which you did a very like class act move, and actually shouted out the Lethality Scion as well, which I was like, that's pretty <laughs> baller from Cabo right now. Um, but can you kind of like walk me through? what the energy because just even looking at you like obviously it helps you beat g2 but like vitality's uh, facility behind you looks really gorgeous uh it feels like there's refresh in this team like the spirit is back you talk about how now you remember that you can win and what that feels like can you kind of like walk me through just how the team feels right now um i mean everyone was very happy and relieved us after the match but we, we know it's only week one it's only been three matches and that's a good like stepping stone to, to start a foundation, but we we know we have much more to do to to keep on going. As I said, like the we have like new office that's really wonderful here. The the gathering has been improved. We went back to the like the sports psychologist and the the, guy, the physical trainer that was helping us as well all the way. So we we went back to all these things for the infrastructure to just um, help us focus on the game, and uh, that's what we're doing right now. I mean, as well uh, after the 216 like uh, split, we had um, I think as Duke said in some interview, um, like three weeks of tryout where we just started practicing and getting a grasp of the meta. So when we came here and we had like two more weeks to or three to train together with Labrov joining, we were all already on the same page to to just focus on yeah experimenting new champs for example and uh, yeah, be, being a step ahead on the meta I think is, is really important. <laughs> Getting the getting the casual wave uh, from teammates in the background, but but Cabo, I gotta I gotta know. Like you had all this practice time leading up, and it's so good to hear how much time that you, the team, that Vitality is investing to make this roster work ahead of the season. Because I think there's a lot of teams that'll scrim for one two weeks heading into a season um, and kind of give their players more space. Maybe that's different with the COVID thing going on. But um, were were you? super optimistic coming into week one that this was going to be completely different did you have all the confidence and kind of like joy that you have now going into week one or were you were you like a little bit scared after last season where everything just it seems like you guys just couldn't get the right players at the right time Melitza couldn't get in you had to sub supports like it was so rough were you were you optimistic did you know once you started playing with this roster that things were going to hit the ground running and it was going to be good or were you still a little bit nervous after the way the last season went well, I, th I think both both states were kind of in the um, 
I think I was actually more optimistic, of course, because I, I knew what we were like able to do, but I I wouldn't know when it was about to hit. Like if it was for week one or week two, week three, depending on like how good of a start we would have gotten, and yeah, I think we'd have mesh. I'm I'm really happy we managed to like get two wins of three games, but uh, I always knew we we had actually really good individuals and we were able to to match um, what uh, best Europe can bring. And I think that is, um, again, we were kind of talking before the interview actually started. What really struck to me is that G2 can no longer just brute force their way through these wins. You know, like teams like Vitality have the talent uh, on the roster now that when G2 did make a misstep and weren't 100% aligned with like what their meta read was going to be, what they were going to do with these picks, that uh, Vitality just gave them a, gave them a spanking. <laughs> just turned around and be like, no, 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 you can't just look past us. You must respect us. And I think that's what's so encouraging as an LEC fan, not just for the G2s and the Fanatics, but you know the teams like the SKs, the Vitalities, um, are, are starting to peak with some of these younger, or not younger, but newer names coming into the league. Yeah, and I think, Cabo, the fact that you talk about not letting kind of G2 be the boogeyman, right? Like you talked about you're scared in the Schalke game, but you're, you were not scared. You did not let give G2 any time or space to like build up a lead or to find ways back in the game. You guys just kept hitting them. Like at every single opportunity is so cool because in the past, you think back like oh, 2016, 2017 G2 when Sven and Mithy joined, people just treated them like just assumed that they were always doing the right thing. They were so scared. I heard, you know, probably was talking about it back in the day. And I think the same thing started to happen when 2019 G2 was put together where people just started doubting themselves when they played. So to so to have the transition where you have this very young lineup full of players who normally in the past, the question is like, are they going to show up on stage in week one? You know, when you're playing with all new players who haven't really set uh, foot on the LEC stage. And now the question is, how hard are they going to smash G2 is is a massive, massive change. Um, uh, yeah, and I think you, you're right about 2019 um like people are respecting G2 uh, as much as they were really good. And I think that's why last last spring, for example, Matt just came out um, with like a very good best of five, for example, because they, they had all these rookies that were not afraid and you can see it in, in their game style. I want to ask a little bit about kind of maybe the resilience or the fragility of Vitality. In a world where you guys don't win these games, like you don't win the Schalke game, you don't win the G2 game, and you guys are looking at like an 0-3 start do you think that you fix the problems where you'd be able to pull up from maybe like a spiral that we kind of saw in the past with Vitality that you just get sucked down and everyone loses the the fortitude of we can do this, we can win? Um, or do you think that you guys have, you know, brought in enough new voices, had uh, structural changes where if that does happen, that you guys can rise back to the top? Um, we, we actually changed like three members from spring to summer. So I think... Um, as much as maybe company could have it in the back of our minds, I think it wouldn't really be a problem if we had a really rough start. Um, but uh, as I said, I think to, to bring confidence even more, I th it was actually important that we still got some some of the wins. Yeah, it, it's very hard for me to tell you what state of mind I would be <laughs> if we were 0-3. But uh, I think we could still like uh, come back and redeem ourselves even even if the split wasn't as, as good as it got right now. But on the other hand, right now we we know like it's it's only the very beginning, and uh, right now what we need most is consistency. We we can do those great things, but if we are not able to do them every time, then we'll not uh, like win all the time. So <laughs> we foc we focus on this mostly. The fanatic game, I think we give we give them such a big um, lead on the eight minutes when they're stacking a bot wave and getting four plates. After that, he he made some great hooks, and we didn't actually show that much the fanatic game. So that's why I think got us um, some hunger for the the match against G2 right after. And it's good to see how, like, how quickly that turned around, right? Because that was a it was a very, very difficult game uh, overall, right? Because like, you never know when Hilly's just going to play a sick game of Blitzcrank, and especially when you've got <laughs> new supports on stage. Yeah, and, yeah Because nice. <laughs> Blitzcrank's one of those champions where it's like, it's 100 or it's 0, right? Either it's carrying a game or it's doing nothing. And always tough to play against Hilly when he's going to have a pop-off performance. Uh, I'm... For this new team, you kind of it feels like you have this very balanced mindset where you're like, hey, gotta stay hungry, gotta stay consistent. Is that a difficult thing to maintain with so many new players? Because it seems like you're, you've, as you said, you've got three new players and they're all very new to playing in LEC. Are these guys a little bit more uh, eager than you are where they're like, we beat G2, we can beat anyone, like, let's go? Or are they also like you focusing just kind of week to week on on the improvement, not worrying about necessarily like, 
you know, one or two wins, but just focusing on on getting better. Um, no, eyes are definitely on on world. So everyone is still tempered, even though we won G2. It like it. Uh, what what matters is going to come in the next weeks and end playoffs. So uh, <clears throat> as well, they all wanted, I think, for like some weeks or months, even some some years, to be in the LEC now. So they they have a, a lot to prove uh, still. I think it's, it's so, so so do I to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think the the really cool thing to hear there is that you're talking about worlds. I think a lot of people in your situation use the word temper, and I think people would temper their ambitions after such a rough split. But I I love that despite like you said two sixteen, which is, I mean, such a mental breaker for so for so many players and so many teams. You're like screw it, we're back, we're going to worlds. Like that instant turnaround um, is is good to hear. Honestly, what what keeps you. Uh, invested Cabo in like the experiment or the dream or the goal of vitality because you've kind of been the rock of what has been a very different look almost every single time with this roster and to you know see through the 216 now onto the other side like when it feels good it feels great but you know like what are what's the motivation for you um I mean I, I think all of the things when I, I like I took some time to reflect on the, the the past split we had and like I think it gives as much motivation to to do that that bad of a split than going towards actually because you want to yeah to redeem yourself to to prove that that's not what you're you're capable of. So um I think we're as, as angry as ever to to know that we can go towards as well. We have the, the four spots right now, so that's a, a little a little more luck I guess for for us definitely i think yeah i think it's also a lot of pressure as well or i think it is but maybe it also frees you up a little bit knowing that there is one more spot there and it all comes down to playoffs which is which is really intense but obviously 2-1 is a, is a really solid start um cabo is kind of like a, a final question before we close this one out who on your team as analysts should we be looking at more because i think you're always the guy we look at first because you've been around for so long right and Melitz is a guy who was kind of hyped up but ng's a very new player we don't know as much about ng we don't know as much about labrov even with the background research i don't think we get to see as much so who should we be looking at more when it comes to these these vitality victories in the weeks to come um i mean i think you can you can look at everyone um everyone but myself maybe the the, the greek button <laughs> is gonna be is gonna be wonderful. I think they got, they have like great things to to showcase. Uh, NG, maybe you won't see as as much. Is is more bringing all this energy and trying to to short call more. So maybe that's not a, a thing you will see as much. And and Melika, I, I think he has more this like um, as much as you're saying I'm the rock for vitality. Is is gonna be I think this uh, this rock that never falls behind and is gonna is gonna be um a threat in the late game and uh, and and useful i think it, it will be the the new rock i like it dude that's so good i'm glad you gave ng a shout out too because i think that that's always one thing that's hard to see right especially if someone's got a voice of leadership you people don't love that as much as they love lee sin highlight reels right people always yeah, miss out on, on the voice it's something that's i think hard <laughs> hard to value from the public without uh, people like you uh saying something about it well thank you again Cabo, so much for taking the time to talk to us ahead of what i'm sure is going to be a, a busy day of scrims yeah, thanks for having me uh, and uh, being able to put my my input. Yeah, we we just uh, keep practicing. This day we couldn't have um, a day off because of Super League, but I actually quite enjoyed the, this format of playing more games. It reminds me of the the old Super Week in in CS, like back in season <laughs> three, when people were getting like to Tenerife or Lille, and you had four games to play, and uh, like you have to prep maybe twice as much. But it it feels very nice to have, having to play more days during the week. That's good to hear, man. I'm glad you like it. I was, I was, I've, there was two kind of schools of thoughts, right? A lot of people remember the Super Weeks very fondly and a lot of people are like, oh God, Super Weeks that are a nightmare. So I, I'm glad you liked it, man. We got one more in week eight. Hopefully it'll be, I will be a very exciting week, a very high pressure week for that playoff seating. But um, yeah, I'm glad to hear you like it, man. Hope you enjoy the day off that you will get next week uh, since we've only got the two days. Oh, yeah. Thanks again, Cabo. We'll talk to you later. Good luck Thanks in the man. Bye. Uh, obviously, thanks again so much to Cabo. Excited to hear how optimistic he and the team are about the things upcoming and how they're they're staying very grounded. They had a very successful match versus G2 this week. Uh, we're talking to Mickey later too, so I think we'll kind of gloss over that one. But the week of upsets, Frosk. Yeah, this was it. You were ready. You wanted to talk about the upsets going on in the league. What's what's your take? <laughs> My take, and I feel like every analyst is like this, that we hate upsets. Maybe because, maybe there's like an inherent bias that we hate upsets because it makes us look stupid, which it always does. Yeah, But also, true. I just, 
okay, there's two ways to look at this. The first way is I am so excited that uh, G2 can fumble a draft and our teams are good enough to punish them repeatedly, that mm. our top teams need to be in top form to maintain their dominance. That is something that is legitimate that you can take away. You're like, yes, SK, yes, Vitality, work it, boys. Make sure that you can't just look back at these teams, that you must practice for them. On the other side, I'm like, it's week one. It's a super week. So if you had shit prep going into the super week, guess what? You had really bad games and you had an extra game on top of that to which then i'm like guess what when we're in playoffs and we're talking about finals the thing that's never going to come out of my mouth as an analyst is like but remember in week one during that upset like it may get referenced at one point but unfortunately i just don't think that there's stock Mm, here's a better way to say this week one upsets are good to praise the teams who won they are not a good tool to take down the teams who lost because it's quite clear why the team probably lost in week one day one Hmm. Wow. Okay. So I feel like that's like a perfectly reasonable stance, but it also, it kind of, it does deflate some of the hype for me, you know, like I want to believe in vitality more because of this and I can't tear G2 down because they're impossible to tear down. We'll ask Mickey about that later. It's so hard to freaking criticize that team because it's just like, I guess we'll try now, boys. 3-0 in finals. Like, what the hell? Um, that's going to be an ongoing I'm issue. Like, you just get really flamboyant when you hear G2. <laughs> and now I can only think of them as like a flamboyant team. <laughs> okay. Drag night with G2. Just the queens coming out. Ugh. Sashay <laughs> away. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry? But like... It, then it's hard to know. So then what do we actually learn from week one? Like, what do we actually take away? That's the big thing for you me. You take probably. away that, uh, again, there's new energy and vitality. They were pulling out new picks like the Scion, mm, that when mm. you do give them weapons that comp, now that he's with his partner in crime, LeBrov, down there, the old Grink bot lane, that they are successful. You take away that uh, uh, SK were making smart macro plays on the map. They outthought Origin when they made that top lane push. And so you're like, oh, SK didn't just win because they had like a cheap strategy or whatever and someone got super fed they won because their fundamentals and baseline of league of legends have increased and now you get to see crown shot outside of elo hell you get to see what the idea of the trick experiment was you do not get to walk away from week one and be like g2's a terrible team i've been waiting my entire life for this and they never lose i'm gonna take this time now to type at them i mean if you really hate g2 you could try to use that you'd probably be wrong in the end but like get your opportunities while you can i guess you know but it's also like the same thing with uh with origin you know if you're Origin will get, I'm sure that they did get a lot of heat this weekend, but it's very clear what happened with their first draft. And then it's very clear what the highs of that team are when they face G2. And my assumption is always going to be, okay, I know what the highs are. So now I guess as an analyst, I'm just gambling on the consistency of seeing those highs every time. Yeah, honestly, a really excellent topic for that's effing dumb. I'm going to try to swear less now that we're out of the clear section where we swear a ton to save our, our editor some time. Thanks, Phil. Um is is like how did that twitch poll not give a hundred percent for alfari in the bet the man is an absolute rock wonder and whippo both literally ran it down that this week. is a per oh my god when t- oh okay no this is a perfect twitch chat thinking that alfari isn't the best top laner let's just think about this whippo ran it down in his lane mm-hmm. and alfaro oh alfaro alfari 1v1 killed wonder who else is your who else you got up there twitch chat who else is the other top laner that's even in that, now, that conversation? In their defense, you could lose yourself in Finn's eyes. That's, <laughs> that's what I'll say. He's a solid top laner and he's a very handsome man. If I was going to vote for anyone else, it'd be him, but that's purely bias. It's just oof, He's got the look of a good player, you know? It's a Romeo on the horse. <laughs> it's a Romeo on the horse. Maybe? Oh, it's, yeah, that kind of stuff tilts me. But, oh, Frost, it makes it so difficult to know. It's crazy to me how much we got wrong, though, coming in with our various buckets. Because I... I Again, if you asked me backstage, what is is it likely that a team doesn't really practice at all for week one and gets blown out because upsets happen? Like, Fnatic lose week ones all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, Fnatic are notorious for having a terrible start, but yet they're almost in every single final. And people still see a G2 or an Origin fall down in week one, usually Fnatic fans, and they're just ready to pounce. That's true. Maybe it's just that built up tension I of feel constant. Like, <laughs> I do want to be clear though that there's also those G2 fans and probably those OG fans out there too. Not that like the really angry fanatic fans don't deserve a little bit of shade now and then, but just like I think as we establish a clearer and clearer set of top teams, like the fan rivalries are not getting more wholesome by any by any means. The comments are definitely getting 
more and more questionable. And ever since we beat Korea, there's always some random guy coming in there being like, well, you have one team. Here's the thing that I think is like the primary, like the definitive takeaway. Mm. We were absolutely wrong about Schalke. We were 100% wrong about Schalke. And SK and Vitality. Oh, no, no, I don't even mind SK and Vitality because we put them in the bucket and like the the re- uh, rationale there was, oh, we don't really know what's going to happen. It's That's a fresh fair. start. Whereas like the context for Schalke was this team will be good. This team will be contesting for uh, for Worlds. And again, it's not about taking teams down. It's about looking at what teams are doing. And Schalke, like they were their own worst enemy. I've never seen someone lose to the shopkeeper so consistently before. Yeah, Lerox, the Lee Sin game was very clear that he was back in his comfort zone on champions and there's like no wrong build path there. Like you really have to be running it down. Uh, to not just build, you know, Warrior into Black Cleaver, I guess, in that game. But yeah, those first two games, Little Rocks really struggled. And like people talk, like Nukes got a lot of criticism. I just had benching is too much, but justified criticism. But the other thing we got to talk about with Schalke is, this is my favorite moment of the week, is the absolutely ludicrous Ophelios play. <laughs> um, people saw it. It was, the, it was the 1v4. And I think the number one comment is, is obviously just like, 200 years of combined experience, blah, 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 blah. But Frost, here's what's, Here's my take on it, right? I think that there are two things in this clip that are stupid, and it's Death Dance and Rogue. <laughs> Ophelios is not the problem in this clip, and if we can roll it now, Deppa, so let's just roll. So if you're not watching in YouTube land, this is a good time to turn into YouTube land, but a, a bunch of stuff happens in this clip, and if you haven't watched it on half speed yet, I recommend going through and watching it on half speed because I've watched it repeatedly. Also, I just have to give a, a special shout out to Sir Daniel Dracos. When this clip was when this was happening live, you called it even before he was able to trade guns. As soon as you saw it, you were like, he's burning ammo. He's going to get the right guns. And then as soon as he got the guns, Drake was like, rogue are screwed, rogue are screwed. Okay, so if you have any complaints about Aphelios, it should not be how the champion is balanced. If it's that you don't understand Aphelios, that's fine. Because this shit is really hard to understand. If you're a pro player, that excuse doesn't count. It's your job to play this game. You need to read. Like, I'm sorry, if you don't have the reading comprehension to understand Aphelios, like, have an analyst explain it to you. But here's everything that happens in this clip. A picture book of Aphelios. Yes. So, first off, for those who don't know, the white gun, the chakrams, are Aphelios' arguably most powerful tool, hands down in terms of individual 1v1. Now, he's fully stacked on chakrams, which essentially means not only can he crit normally, he's got a guaranteed extra crit on top of that from chakram damage. On top of that, the closer you stand to Aphelios when he has chakram out, the, the faster. faster his attack speed is. So what essentially happens here is Finn misses his barrel. Can we roll the clip again, Dabba? Well, we can just roll the clip and maybe just ad nauseum in the background. Yeah. So what you're going to watch here is 20 chakrams, death dance as well. So Finn misses the first barrel, which denies the armor penetration. That would have been big. That would have been enough to kill Inax. Similarly, he then walks into melee range. This is a big int move because what happens when you're in melee range of Aphelios in this stage? You, when he has 20 chakrams, he's doing essentially four times damage because you've essentially doubled his attack speed. And on top of that, because he has 20 chakrams, you doubled his damage output. So he is just shredding through everyone. Well, the things that Rogue could have done here to make this better. At the stop, they could have not let their mid laner die. Great. They could have also just played it slower. Yep. Because he has Runans, and he's in a creep wave too. So he is max healing off literally every th- single thing possible. If Finn hits the barrel, that guy dies. If um, They should have just waited until the EQ was up from Jarvan, yeah. hit it, and then layered everything on top of it. If he's in the air as like a barrel comes down, as an Ezreal Q yep. comes down, yep. he instantly dies. But because they like high-fived, tried to chain together all of their different efforts and, to take him down. Like, oh my god, it's a 1v4. No, it's not. There's it's a, a 1v1v1v1. Uni- 1v, 1v, 1v. No, 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 no. It's a 2v. It's a 2v. It's a 2v1 because GP does a little bit of damage, but then kind of ends the play, right? Ezreal gets there, but can't hit all the shots because the creep wave is coming in at the perfect time, which, you know, God bless the cannon minion that blocks, I think, a Yumi Q for him. Um, and Yumi, Yumi and Jarvan, Jarvan's full tank. He's full tank. He has Warmogs, Cinder Hulk, and Gargoyle Stoneplate. He does not do damage. His only contribution is to shred Jin's armor. Yumi, same boat. Yes, her E is broken, but without her alt, she doesn't do any damage. So this is the literally the equivalent if you don't follow dbz this is going to get weird and this just goes perfectly into my explanation right if you don't follow they they walked into melee range of ultra instinct goku and then they wondered why they died this is the only time this champion is this powerful people wouldn't say the same thing if they're like oh you walked into darius with his passive fully stacked you're an idiot why would you do that but because it's an 80 carry people are like oh my god it's so unbelievably powerful how could this work now if you've not watched dragon ball z and you're like dracos how the hell am I supposed to know that Ultra Instinct is stronger than Super Saiyan Blue Goku, which is stronger than Super Saiyan Long Ass Gold Hair 
Super Saiyan 3 Goku, which is good. And that's fine. I get it. If you're a casual player and you don't want to do the background reading to understand when this character is strong, I get that. But these are pro players and they literally just ran into this guy when he's at his most powerful. If you just fed into it any juggernaut in the game, you get a similar result. Like, no one would ask this question if it was Darius. They'd be like, why did you talk to, uh, walk into Darius when he had his alt reset up and he had his Noxian friggin' passive? Like, that's so dumb. But that's what people sound like when they complain about this character. Also, Death Stance, which I think is a legitimate problem. Death Stance is a legitimate problem. It essentially, because it extends your lifespan on characters with this much life steal, I like, agree. Oh. I agree. This is only par- possible because of Death Stance. And it's not just the life steal aspect of Death Stance. It's the fact that it builds out of resistances and doesn't really cost you a lot in terms of damage output. Like that... That's a big deal. We can all agree Death Dance is stupid, but Ophelia's killing this many people is a reading comprehension issue. Yeah. And yeah. Well so, well said, Draco. I'm so tilted. I was it. just like... They have like three opportunities to kill him or they can just chill and walk him down. Yeah, but instead they made all those 200 years memes and... They gifted. They literally just gift this guy a montage moment. The balance team is like messaging They're Rogue. Like, Here's like, your consolation prize for the week. Shalka, we'll give your your ADK. And don't get me wrong, Inex puts it well. He auto attacks two different barrels from Finn. I think you explained he picks it. Picks the targets well, r- like really well backstage. Because again, I got the opportunity and big Ophelios player over here. I got the opportunity to watch that clip with Dracos, and I cannot underline this again. Dracos knew that that was going to happen, obviously before Rogue knew that that <laughs> was going to happen. So the reading comprehension was there that you understood how the uh, the kit was going to work. Um, but you were like talking about how the choices that he had to make in X, of course, the Ophelios mm-hmm. player, he made the right choices on the right beats each time. So it's not yeah. like he was just piloting a broken champion on a broken item. I mean, to be fair, like he's in his most powerful point in the game. So at that point, once he's there and they walk into him, the only skill expression from NX is hitting his Q skill shot and autoing the gangplank barrels. After that, it pretty much runs itself. But him to get himself in that situation, to play it slow, to keep auto attacking in a way that keeps his shock rooms up is really good. If he makes a single mistake there, he dies. No questions about it. But he plays it flawlessly. Is it the most difficult once he's in that situation? No. no. Because Rogue technically have all the agency in that play. All they need to do is not walk into him and no one dies. And they can probably kill him by just walking him down with Yumi Ezreal. Think of how much is not in your brain that's useful because you have the whole Dragon Ball Z <laughs> mythology as well as the Aphelios sky guidebook. <laughs> It is at least three years of League of Legends that I've just forgot just to make this segment possible. You get a poppy in your game like I've I don't know I that. What does that do? Does she have Does she have Stupid guns? Stupid champion! How am I supposed to know the wall stops me? Visibility, riot, please. Um. Anyway, that's my rant. Um. And that's enough about Shalka because they're kind of depressing. But SK versus OG, I think, is a game that we need to talk about because it showed us a lot of things about OG. It raised a lot of old flags again. And similarly, uh, showed us a lot of new things from SK, as we already mentioned. So excitement there. But OG, I did it, in a reoccurring trend, Froskeren, we have bottom laners, bottom lane support specifically, that we expect to be doing good things. Uh, kind of running it down. Shout out to our boy Destiny. Really difficult Nautilus uh, misfortune game where from talking to OG, they felt like they were going to have an advantage, uh, advantageous bot lane. They were going to be able to get the push there and they were going to take over the game. And instead what happened was they died and they immediately lost all pressure and the game was impossible to win. They took really bad trades initially in the lane phase. And the thing is, like when you see an Ezreal locked in, um, and especially also with the Thresh, you're like, Nautilus, so good. He has an ultimate that it doesn't matter if Ezreal shifts away. It's going to follow him anyway. Uh, my Q is faster than Thresh his Q, so I should be able to win these trades anyway. And yet, in the lane phase, Destiny was still taking, he was standing on the wrong side of the lane, he was still taking a lot of uh, poor trades, and then just, unfortunately, didn't have a great showing. Um, but this draft, like, Destiny was not the only reason why Origin lost this game. Uh, it felt like a very weird read on draft. I think the meme was like, this is spring Origin again, like, they ran it back out. But the funny thing is, we... Was that our meme? Did we cast that game? It's all blurs together. It was three days. We did cast that game, and we got called Origin Biased. Oh, yeah. Because we were talking about how Origin were trying to, like, Rubik's Cube solve this problem. Because they still won, I think, two team fights. Like, not one, but, like, evened two team fights that they absolutely should have lost because the power of Alfari. I think he used some mm. really good TPs and was playing or piloting Aatrox really well. Uh, but, like, 
Origin were definitely on the back foot compositionally. Like, oh my God, they got so hard outdrafted, in my opinion. And the fact that they even kept this game significantly close for a portion of it. I'm like, Origin were trying to outthink this way, but I'm guaranteed that halfway through those comms, they're like, ah, well, this one was lost in draft. I guess uh, roll the dice, see if we win it, otherwise go next. It's so true and it's so sad. Uh, as long as we're talking about OG, I think we got to talk about the other OG, like the positive note for OG, but I'm going to hit it on a negative side, which is going to make some people sad. But like, I rewatched that OG G2 game. And I don't know what you're thinking because I know you've watched it too. I'm thinking that G2 didn't have great preparation. And if Origins only win is against the team that didn't scrim coming into the week, I'm like, that's not great. It's not a great look. And my biggest concern is, as much as I want to use this as a tool to praise OG and be like, OG have turned over a new leaf. They can play more aggressive. They can close a game. Um, watching that game back was not a good look. Now, credit to Zerse, absolutely out-jungled Yankos in the early game. Got off tons of successful ganks. Credit to Wonder, uh, or not Wonder, credit to Wonder for running it down so hard. Um, Alfari. He, credit to Alfari. Wonder clearly was not prepared for that matchup, and Alfari absolutely blasted him from, from start to finish. And... But the thing that was is that up until that set flank in mid lane that led to Baron for OG, still a 50-50 Baron and a very close one at that, mind you, G2 were coming back. They were finding kills in a deficit that they shouldn't have found, like, to me. So while it's easy, I think, at the moment to be like, my God, OG, such geniuses. The more I watch that game, the more I'm scared that the upgrades that I thought I saw for OG initially just might not be there. The shine of like the victory over G2 just blinded you a little bit. Yeah. Now, nah, again, it's one of those things where uh, as an, an analyst preparing to like cast Origin, I'm not ready to, you know, Origin on top of the world or just like, I know it sounds like I'm a downer on them and Origin obviously feel very strongly that we're constantly downers on them, but I'm seeing a trend and the trend showed up in game number one. And I just, I don't like the trend. And it's influencing more than the G2 victory is influencing. And I keep hearing all of these things about Origin. Like, you know, scrims are doing really well. Or the team feels really confident. Or like all of these things. But I never see it translate when it matters. And if your only claim to fame right now is you beat G2 on a week where they looked like garbage really against everyone except for their opening game. Mm. Like, that's not good enough? I don't think that that's, like, their only clip. I don't think... I think OG were confident about this week and they walked in and they got... Um, I think uh, Zerse on set jungle looked great. I love mm -hmm. seeing Zerse yes. play more aggressive. I think Afari is still the best top laner in the league. I think Upset is so underrated for how good he is. Like, I cannot believe he has, like, these bad connotations. And it's, that feels so bad to be like, this player is good, this player is good, this player is good. But then collectively as a team, you're like, such a bummer, man. Yeah. I think the thing is, once again, the goalposts for OG are very high. The question for OG is not can they be top four. Like, we believe that they can get there again. They can get there again doing what they did last split. They were very good at it, short of something really coming out and surprising us to surpass them. But we want, and I think OG fans want, and rightfully so, to see them push G2 and Fnatic. To see them embrace... I think that's what my problem is. My problem is not anything to do with the players or the collective players of Origin. Mm. My problem is, is the philosophy of how they think about the game and how they play the game. And I don't know if that comes from the players, if that comes from the coaching staff. It's probably more likely a, a union of both. That's my problem with Origin. And that's unfortunately very unfair because you know that if if origin just decide to play that way like that's how it is but again you go across all those players nothing against them really like them really great players super talented how they have chosen to think and play about the game i'm just not about it yeah and i think the thing is is the reason i think that criticism wall it, it feels like very personal to you but also is justified is that they've tried to play this way for so long and it's never worked so asking for something different doesn't seem unreasonable that said og can set their sights on worlds for now, things look dire, but if you're an OG fan or if you've seen any splits with OG involved, you can be pretty confident they will be finding their way into playoffs. Um, we'll kind of see how they develop. The last team on the list, it's technically not an upset, but it kind of is. It's Misfits versus Fnatic and what was <laughs> the biggest heartbreaker of a game that led into a massive heartbreaker of a week for Misfits because it was, for those who didn't watch their Saturday game, was awful flashbacks to spring week one where they just could not get anything together it was an absolute disaster of individuals getting caught out left and right um that's where a lot of the let's bench dos criticism came for once again too much uh in my opinion i feel so bad for dos it's not fair dude it's your first week you get a break right Ra razorick maybe deserves a little bit more flame because he did it last split too and there's no reason for him <laughs> to be 
there's nerves or nerves, right? Like you can't decide when they come, but like you would expect more from him, I guess, at this point. But that game is so tragic because I feel like that could have been the pa- the positive note to kick off the Misfits split to kick off Kabe's return to Europe because for the first 20 minutes, it was. Kabe was a monster. Like we couldn't have written the script better than that. And then in the... M. Night Shyamalan way that the real world works out that we can never predict Reckless. And like, if you've listened to the voice comms, this is super cool for us. I don't know if you saw Bike Check, but Reckless is like, yeah, let's burst it. He's talking to self made. He's like, we're going to burst this. We're going to make this happen. And then they just do it. And like the fact that fanatics see that, the fact that those two players in this moment of tension are communicating so well, is like huge props to Fnatic, but also is so sad because what Razork is saying the whole time is, guys, we don't need to force this end. We play it out smartly and we win the game. That's what he's saying. That's level headed. That's good call. But you can't. Sometimes you get 50 50 on and the game's just over. Sometimes they make the impossible steal possible. It's not even a 50 50 because they knew that they could do it. And that's, oh, okay. So here's a. Oh, they had Callista too, didn't they? Oh my God. How did they, how did they, this fits into this, this idea that I talk about, uh, or that I was talking about to you on the desk. Okay. So let's say we have, um, Dracos and Frostkirin, Mm -hmm. and these are our two professional players. And let's say that Dracos is capable of an 80. Yep. And like the scale goes to 100. You're capable of an 80. But right now you're playing at a 65. Yeah, more like a 40, but good example. Yeah. <laughs> 65. <laughs> I, Frost Garen, incapable of a 70, less than you, you're at the 80, but I'm playing at that 70. Yeah. And so immediately speaking, you would pick me if you were incapable of unlocking that 80. And I yeah. feel like that's where a lot of orgs are. They're incapable of taking a young player and they're unlocking the 80. And that that only comes with time and experience in a moment where like Reckless is talking to self-made and knows that that is a possibility, that he has the whole 100 unlocked. And I feel like that more often comes from time, experience. It's this idea that you have, you've been in so many different situations that you have a muscle memory or you've seen everything Mm. so you know how to react to it versus a system being built in League of Legends that coaches and analysts are able to train players to understand like it only works to to so yeah. high, like a basic fundamental. And so teams like Mad Lions, teams like Misfits, like what they've done with their young players is really inspiring. But that's always that, like that's the dream goal of you get your Feb event, you get your Razor, and you can, you know, through osmosis, this little baby jungler can get all of this experience from Febivin and somehow unlock You look him. like a parent awkwardly trying to explain <laughs> the birds and the bees, like in a way that like doesn't give away any actual information. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're not in YouTube land, check this one out for the hand gestures in the Ophelios clip because there's a lot of fantastic there's a lot hand of, There's a lot of hand gestures. But this is this is the issue. This is why teams always go to roster swaps because they, I don't know if they realize this, but what they're trying to fix is unlocking the full potential of a player. They don't know how to do it. So it's much easier just to grab the player that has the immediate potential available to mm. them, which is what everyone will always do. But if misfits just stay the course, which hopefully then means that the community doesn't boo uh, guys like DOS or, off the or stage. Or their support staff has enough heads up to just ban social media in their house. If social, if like social media is being that vitriolic to the point where like there's nothing to be learned from it, then there's no point in engaging with it. Right. And like, but like the, the inverse is true is that if like, if we want misfits to do this and they play DOS an entire season and it never gets any better, then we kind of look dumb. So it's a hard decision to make. <laughs> but even just saying that or pointing out the, to a problem still doesn't fix the fact that how do you teach that reckless self made moment? How do you give someone that information that that is even possible? Because you're right. Razork was probably being very level headed on the other side, knowing exactly what to do. But it wasn't good enough. And that's the thing that the coach teaches you. Like, this is where you place your wards. This is how you're communicating. This is, you know, like, are you guys turning off the Baron or staying on the Baron? Like, when it comes down to this much health, you know, burn all of your abilities because that's when you want to burst. And someone has to be on the back end zoning it off. But this is why we have, like, our icons and our legends are so good. Because they have something that no coach could ever give them. Which is, they have been there. They have done that. Nothing you could throw at them could surprise them. Yeah. It's incredible. And I think in a future episode later this season, we'll we'll get a chance to talk more about kind of player development as a topic and a concept. I think it'll be interesting too when Yamato has already soft committed to an episode so we can get his perspective on how the Korean scene works and how they unlock player. Potential. I hope his team's winning when we call him. I really hope so too. It's gonna be, I do not want to see Sad Boy Yamato. We almost had Sad Boy DeFiscio on this week. He's uh, also soft promised to come on next week, so you'll get your full share of which potentially is, Sad Boy DeFiscio next which week. Which is why we got to flame Origin so hard this week. Martin, this is your fault. You could have been on could've this been episode. Yeah, boys, you could have been here to defend them. Instead, no one's here. It's kind of like your draft. We're literally cyberbullying Martin right now. That's how this works. Um, 
anyway, um, as kind of our final thing for the day, we want to do, we have an interview standing by with Mickey X. We want to talk to him a bit more about what's going on in the G2 house and kind of how they're feeling so far about their summer split and obviously a, a somewhat difficult week one. So let's check it out. All right. And now we're joined by none other than the fabulous G2 support Mickey X, the Tom Kench master. Tom Kench and Yumi really uh, pushing the skill bar this weekend. Mickey, how are you feeling after, uh, let's say, a questionable week one? Yeah, I'm feeling uh, as good as ever, even though I went one, two. I had time of my life playing two of my favorite champions. So, yeah, couldn't be better, honestly. Blink twice if, like, Grabs is behind you, just like, and you're just desperately hoping not to play Tom <laughs> Kench again. And you're just like, of course, I love it. I love it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Got that, Grabs. I mean, yeah. Next time I'll just pick whatever. So, in, in terms of like overreactions, community's like, oh, G2, 1, 2, we've been waiting our whole lives for this moment to pounce. Uh, is, do you guys feel any pressure in the gaming house as Grabs like pulling you into side rooms like, okay, guys, you had your fun. Uh, now it's time to <laughs> buckle down. Or is it pretty much like cruise control, this was expected? Yeah, not quite. I mean, we were just all kind of talk after the game and we're like, yeah, I mean, if we honestly just like scrimped this week, we'd probably know what to draft or how to draft, but we were just like kind of picking whatever we felt was strong, but not really building a team comp around our first rotation. So it was just kind of awkward in the end. And as I said a few times before, the better drafter does win most of the time, at least if teams are like somewhat even. Wait, um, so yeah. Mickey, you, you said you didn't build a team comp around your first rotation. Your last game against Vitality, you literally picked Aphelios first, spent your entire draft building a team comp around no, Aphelios no, 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 no. and still got fucked. Yeah, so that was... Okay, so that's the point. <laughs> we were trying to, but we failed at it because we had four tanks or something. Yeah. And Aphelios was our only damage dealer. And our only peel for Aphelios was Tom Kench. And they had like so much like AOE CC that I couldn't really like save him with my W only. But if we had like Galio, Leeson, and what do we have top Orn in the Ezreal Yumi game, we would actually have a front line. But then we had Leeson, Wukong, and then I got one shot every fight. So if we swap those two, well, Botland champions around, so for, so the game day two, we play the Aphelios, Tom Kench. The game is much easier because we actually had some damage besides Aphelios with Zoe, Wukong. So even if they go on all Aphelios, I waste my Tom Kench eat, but then the rest of the team can actually do damage. So if we swap those around, then it makes sense. But they're just like, yeah, we just got trolled. I feel like the pro player explanation of things is always like, makes sense when you follow through all of it. But I'm like, ah, I saw that draft. Caps is on Galio, not on a damage dealer. This is probably a big L for G2. <laughs> when Mickey's like, we had four tanks and we didn't have enough space for the Aphelios and then I couldn't burn on the W. Come on. I mean, there's validity there. Yeah, yeah for sure. But I mean, behind the scenes, I, I've... It was a weird week for a lot of players on G2, I would say. I'd say bot lane was a little rough. Uh, giving up Thresh, I think, was, wasn't was objectively wrong, but I was just like, oh, man, your life's just going to be so hard this game. Just that champion is so good right now. Um, was it disrespect yeah. uh, to give away the, the Thresh, Mickey, like on reflection? Did you guys even no, think that it was going to happen? No, no, no. We were just like, in scrims, when I picked the Philios and we picked Thresh, we just played Tom Kench, and then it was kind of fine, like just laning. But uh, I think we didn't play against Kalista Thresh and Scrims, which was a bit harder than just Thresh with like an Ezreal or something or an MF. Um, so that was a bit of a change, but I don't think it was that big of a problem as it was a problem that our team comp was just not very good. So, Mickey, um, I kind of asked Reckless on PGL at the end of the week kind of about what he actually took away from week one in terms of like relative team strengths because i think it's always hard i mean it's a three game sample size so it's a little bit bigger than a normal week one but it's still hard to know what's what actually matters here so from the g2 losses what should we actually be impressed by right because i think you guys are always like ah we didn't scrim for a week we'll go next but like when mad lions upset you we we're like holy crap mad lions are so good and then you like showed up and smashed everyone right so like is the OG win impressive? Is the Vitality win impressive? Like as as broadcast analysts, like what should which which team impressed you more? What did they do well that caught you off guard? Or is this just like a up oh, G two drafted poorly? Here we are, nothing we could have done. Um, I think well, both OG and Vitality played pretty well as a team. I think OG were pretty good at throwing us off from day one when they drafted MF Nautilus Gragas first rotation. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they picked Aphelios, Lulu, so like, okay, it's a bit of a change. And they actually, like, yeah, played around their lanes pretty well. 
Um, and Vitality, yeah, I mean, the Cyan pick was a bit new to us, I guess. And yeah, they just played team fights well. And that was kind of it, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. Mickey doesn't really get an answer there. It's not like he's going to come out and be like, nothing they did. I mean, the only respectable answer is for a team to be like, oh, yeah, you know, they just played well and that's what happens. You can't yeah, look but at the team be like, I was <laughs> really surprised by how good Vitality were. Or like, in this case, he's like, yeah, OG's draft caught us off guard because they drafted like absolute I animals. Think the new nu- yeah. nuance, and Mickey, you don't have to respond to this if you don't want to, but like as an analyst, it's always ridiculously hard to discount G2 because you know that if they just go away and maybe in a night <laughs> really hardcore prep a draft that they can go into a final and they can 3-0. And so you see G2 make clear drafting errors. You're like, uh, I guess it's just like a wash. It wasn't really serious for them. And then the fans don't want to hear that. And then the fans get mad at us, Mickey, and it's your guys' fault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It's, I don't mind hearing that, like, we're just bad because we kind of are, you know. Like, you, you can just say, yeah, G2 are very bad right now, but then we'll probably get good. But That I'm level two int on your Tom Kench was pretty bad. Okay, it was pretty bad, but I got, like, so overconfident from the level one trades. It's unbelievable. Like, level one was already... I, I thought the game was over level one after I saw those trades. So then yeah. I just, like, yeah, walked up to level Which, two power spot. Credit to comp. Um, we've had Kaba on the short show today as well, but credit to Conf, he's so big brain that by tanking those two Tom yeah. Kench cues, he baited you into a false sense of security and then just absolutely blasted you level two. But I can understand where Mickey's coming from because LeBrov missed the first flay on him and then nailed the second one. Yeah, I should have just like flashed the hook, but or something. But yeah, I was just like, if, if you didn't hit the flay, how can you hit the hook? Like seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah is this what but happens yeah. in comms though mickey like when you see trades like that do you just look at luca and you're just like this guy can't hit anything we could play hyper aggressive or do you just always like buy the book this is how this lane's supposed to play out oh uh, no in the comms i was like oh geez what is this <laughs> or something i was like wow we're so good but uh yeah then we weren't so good um mickey now looking forward towards week two Obviously, it sounds. Are you guys scrimming again? Is this a, is this a much more serious week for G two? Uh, Frost cast earlier, and it doesn't seem like you guys are taking the loss super hard. But can we expect a leveled up, maybe uh, better reads on the draft version of of G two this week? I mean, I think so. Yeah, we yeah we don't didn't really take. I mean, we won't take any breaks this week, mm. and we're just yeah scrimming. And uh, so far, I would say our drafts are getting better. Uh, we've expanded our champion pools a little bit. So I think I'm not stuck on Tom Kent Yubi anymore. Hopefully I'll play something else. I think. Um, but yeah, honestly, look, looking pretty good. Are you going to play Leona? I could play Leona, yeah. Has a pretty high win rate in uh, LPL. So I might just have to pick it up here. I'm waiting for like a good Leona player to come out of the woodwork. I don't like. I don't mind seeing the Blitzcrank Mickey, but I would love to see a Leona. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a very good Leona player, but I do have a 100% win rate on her, so... <laughs> <laughs> Medic's not a great Leona player, too, and apparently his win rate's boosted as well. That's true. <laughs> I just like how we just drag Medic out of nowhere just to, just to, just to throw shade. Um, last question before we let you go, Mickey. Um, you said you're not taking any breaks. I just want to gauge how serious this split feels for G2, because I think when we had our first episode, we talked a lot about how it feels like G2 and Fnatic might as well already be at Worlds. Now, we're obviously getting a little bit of ahead, of ahead of ourselves, but you guys have always been the clear number one and number two for so long. How does it feel for you playing these games week to week? Is it just kind of waiting for playoffs? Is it try hard to the max to get the highest seed you can for playoffs? Like, what's how's G2 feeling about summer split in general? I mean, it's honestly been... I mean, it's only week one, but it didn't feel as try hard as it could have been. We're just kind of just like chilling and making playoffs. And then, yeah, when playoffs comes, I guess we'll ramp it up a bit. But yeah, regular split, we just, I guess, get as many wins as we can. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much it. Can, playoffs. can you peel back the curtain a little bit, Mickey, and kind of give us an example of like what a try hard week for G2 really feels like because you guys do feel like completely different animals when we know that g2 is like about to be serious and like put their nose to the grindstone i think i feel the most difference when we're actually really prepared just in draft when before the day before the match we discuss like every possibility in draft and we just talk like one or two hours about drafting and then if we do that i feel very prepared and that's when i think we like take the game very seriously that usually happens in playoffs but for regular season we just like maybe have like uh, 10 20 minutes talk of like what we should probably ban 
and what we should pick in the first rotation, and then that's kind of it. It doesn't feel as do, I mean, it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Do your calms change at all, like in game, when you have like that preparation? Like, are you guys talking about like further on plans, or is it very much the same? Like, while the preparation outside of draft is hardcore, in game, you guys still have that same spirit of you know, a guy misses a flay and a final, like, oh, she so. Oh. <laughs> no, that's pretty much similar. Yeah. <laughs> it pretty much. If you have it in playoffs, I would still probably do the same and just like start giggling and run it down. But yeah, <laughs> I just look forward to the the day where you're in a, like a really high stake world playoff match and emotes are enabled and you start emoting when people oh, yeah. miss skill shots. That's my only request from G two as a team. Like anytime you're up two zero in a series and a third game you're like confident you'll win, but you're you know you 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 know you can afford to give one up. That's when I want to see the emote BM just start coming out. That's my that's my wish as a European fan for you, Mickey. Yeah, I mean I need to get used to it. Like so far, I always forget that there's emotes until the game is over. Like ah oh, shit, I forgot again. <laughs> I could have BM yeah. that guy. Dang it! Hopefully, Missed I can improve this week and start spamming some emotes. Well, let's let's yes, let's start with the draft. We can move on to emotes as the, as the second <laughs> yeah, priority. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for talking to us, Mickey. We'll let you go now um, for your what I'm sure is another busy day of scrims. But yeah, thanks for the insight into G2 and uh, ready to see what you guys look like coming into week two. All right, always good to hear from the young michael x um i totally forgot what I was, frost you had opinions go <laughs> you can yeah. tell by the end of the episode that we uh the professionalism starts to die and we get into uh i took notes um <laughs> <laughs> preparation okay <laughs> ah, he... <laughs> we're gonna keep rolling because i think people like because like we could cut this and just like pretend like this never happens and we're perfect podcast hosts but i think it's more endearing when we people have see the that we're interviews like on the constant... front half and then we have to go through and so i was like this time around it was my actionable because last week ran into this problem i was like i'll take notes so that way i don't forget you remember what happened we can talk about it later yeah and i wrote calm stay the same not scrimmed for a week preparation especially on draft the especially best part of this is that who's ever listening to this podcast just heard the interview and has a perfect memory of what happened and they're now watching you clown around in your notepad being like they're like no mickey literally said like a million intelligent things and your notes are scrim bad g2 no play g2 play more this week i think the most interesting thing ever from g2 is this idea at least from my perspective is this idea that they're an analyst's worst nightmare yeah you can never prepare for this team and like the teams facing them talk about this all the time and trying to like prepare draft and at the end of the day it always comes down to you don't prepare a draft against g2 you just try to see what you want and you try to get what you want and you play your best game and you let them do whatever it is that they're going to do over there and mm. hopefully you survive um but as an analyst especially when g2 run it down like the thing is is they're like the rocks tigers i don't know if i've ever said this on air but i say it behind the scenes all the time if a team smiles at g2 g2 will smile back and when i say that and what that means is that when someone's getting frisky in the river and it's over scuttle crab for no reason g2 are the type of team to be like you want to go yeah let's do that they won't think go. like there's no point to do that like obviously if it's that guy <laughs> in the fox shirt or the tap out shirt at the bar who's just like looking for a reason to fight just a single thing did you slam your is that what was that more than 10 decibels on that glass <laughs> slam down there friend it's a quiet bar you respect this they just start going in wait the thing is is like like the rocks tigers who were so good they, i think they had the record at worlds for um what like 18 and 0 kills on a lee sin or something it was just mm. absurd like when they smashed a team they obliterated a team but then they'd also run back into another game and be like let's dance around and have some fun with this and that's that's just what you get i see it a lot with the lpl teams which is why when i see it in g2 i'm willing to accept the bad with the good and still recognize that they're the best team even though they have all of these terrible habits but I guess I've just been brainwashed into that. Like the clockwork orange came into my eyeballs and I've had all that LPL footage. And so I'm just like, yeah, this is how this works. Whereas I still I hear, I hear Vettius in his VOD reviews next to me, just sighs all the time. And just, why do you have to be like this? And it's because he was trained by Deficio and Crapo. He wants the perfect League of Legends. And when he looks at G2, sometimes he doesn't get it. But I'm like, that's just how life is. You can't have perfection without like... One is defined by the other. You have to see the lows to understand how good the highs are. The ultimate thing if you're a pro player and you're like not happy with how you're presented on broadcast is to win the split repeatedly, but do it in like the dumbest way possible because then all the analysts in your region have to call it the best version of League of European League of Legends. And not that G2 have any beef with the analysts, but that's what G2 have done. No matter what they do, we like have to give them the benefit of the doubt until they're objectively running it down because they've just won literally everything. 
And that makes it hard to talk about G2. We still found a way on this episode. I'll wrap us up here. We've had we've had a fun one. Thanks to Cabo and Mickey for coming on. Um, thank you to everyone who who tuned in from the start. Um, yeah, I don't really know that. Ready check. It's going to start tomorrow at 1730 Central European Summertime. We're What's kicking off with week? Vitality versus Rogue. Our match of the week is Fnatic Origin? Fnatic Origin. I got a nod. Fnatic Origin. I've been prepping for this podcast, not for the cast yet. You can see I'm a highly trained professional. Keck W. All right. Um, <laughs> see you for season six, episode three next week, dear friends.